Hello class, welcome to lecture 13. And in this lecture, we're going to be introducing the concept of scales of motion and some topics related to that. So this is something that we've kind of touched on in some previous lectures, but now we're going to actually explore it in a little bit more depth and also look at some of the mathematics behind it because uh, we just love math that much. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So the whole idea behind a scale of motion is they're used to classify weather phenomena based on a characteristic scale of time and a characteristic scale of length. And we'll talk more about what we mean by that uh, in the next uh, next several minutes. Uh, so far, primarily what, we, what we've been focusing on is synoptic scale phenomena. So some examples of that, trough ridge systems, cyclones, anticyclones, uh, haven't really focused on uh, other other phenomena, but the synoptic scale phenomena, those are pretty much the big scale, the really big weather patterns that we look at in the atmosphere. And this is important, this, uh, this, uh, this is kind of important, and we've seen an example of this uh, at, when we looked at a uh, lecture, I believe it was 10, when we introduced the concept of cyclostrophic balance. If your scale of motion is small enough, then there are certain things that you can neglect. And one of the examples we looked at is the Coriolis force, how the Coriolis force can be neglected in the case of a tornado because a tornado is too small to be influenced by the Coriolis force. But now we're going to start exploring the idea of what exactly is too small and can we get sort of a mathematical basis for that. And that's going to be the main topic for this lecture. And as scales of motion, we can also account for the vertical direction, but usually when you think of scales of motion, or when you look at scales of motion, you're mostly looking at what's happening in the horizontal direction, and so, to some extent what's happening with time. How, What's the characteristic time for a cyclone, which is, the answer to that is usually uh, several days, sometimes even a week, whereas a tornado, tornadoes under normal circumstances don't last longer than maybe an hour, but most tornadoes are down and up within a few minutes, so... Uh, already we can sort of get an idea of how the t characteristic time scales and length scales can vary depending on the size of the phenomenon that we're looking at in the atmosphere. But just to sort of get a, an initial bearing, typically when we're thinking about synoptic scale phenomena, we think about uh, something that's 400 kilometers, uh, characteristic length of 400 kilometers or larger. So uh, a cyclone is usually more than 400 kilometers large. Uh, sometimes you can go to even to go to just the upper bound of what the Earth's uh, the Earth's circumference is, or the Earth's diameter is, for this upper bound of four thousand kilometers. Uh, sometimes that's referred to as planetary scale or global scale, but for now we're going to focus mainly on synoptic scale, which typically has a length scale of four hundred kilometers to about four thousand kilometers. An example of this, as we mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, was a cyclone, but you can also think of it uh, an anticyclone or a trough ridge system. Mesoscale typically is what we use to classify phenomena that have a width or a size of 3 kilometers to 400 kilometers. And one of the common examples of this would be, say, something like a squall line. So a nice springtime or summertime squall line typically has a characteristic length scale of 700, several hundred kilometers. And the microscale is basically anything that's smaller than 3 kilometers in diameter. So an example of this might be a tornado. Uh, unless maybe you have the El Reno tornado, if you have something that's a lot bigger than the El Reno tornado, but uh, typically tornadoes are classified as microscale phenomena because most of the time their width is, or their characteristic length scale is under three kilometers. And I should also point out that the values that I put up on the screen here, those are not universally agreed upon. There are different countries, different meteorological entities that use different rules of thumb. So these numbers are by no means golden rules set in stone values for these different scales. These are just the preferences, I believe, uh, that are used by AMS, the American Meteorological Society. These are, this is what AMS uses, but different countries and different meteorological organizations will use different numbers to, uh, different numbers to characterize these different scales. But let's also go ahead and take a look, closer look at this whole idea of the scales that we introduced. So again, synoptic scale, just using the definition from the previous slide, 400 kilometers to 4,000 kilometers, that's the typical length or width of a particular phenomenon on the, on the synoptic scale. But also synoptic scale phenomenon, as we sort of mentioned earlier, can last for several days and typically last for several days, sometimes even weeks. And a lot of times, again, the example of this is a cyclone or an anticyclone. A cyclone can last for several days. It typically has a life cycle of 
I say around three to five days, sometimes longer, depending on the system. But uh, typically, when we think of synoptic scale, we think of something that's very large and also that's something that evolves very slowly through time that is lasts a very long time. And also on the synoptic scale, since, and this is something we kind of alluded to when we introduced Coriolis force, we mentioned that Coriolis force is only significant on very large scales of time and space. And synoptic scale certainly fits both of those criteria. It is a very large length scale, very large time scale. So Coriolis force is definitely something that we need to consider when we're working on the synoptic scale. And again, examples of this cyclone, anticyclone, trough ridge system. And we'll actually explore trough ridge systems in a little bit greater depth as we start talking about Rossby waves, which we'll save for a later segment. Mesoscale phenomenon. And you can also break the mesoscale phenomenon down into additional subcategories. Uh, sometimes you'll hear uh, the term alpha mesoscale, beta mesoscale, gamma mesoscale, which are additional subcategories of mesoscale. There are actually quite a few mesoscale phenomena that are present in the atmosphere, and uh, each one almost has its own classification, really. there's You could almost have a subcategory for each phenomenon because there's just so many mesoscale phenomena, and they don't always have the exact same size. But just be aware that there are multiple different subcategories of, of mesoscale, uh, but usually for most of them, we're talking about phenomena that can range from 3 kilometers to 400 kilometers in diameter. And most mesoscale phenomena typically have a time scale of several hours. Although some phenomena, like say a long-lived derecho or squall line, those can last for several days. Also something called a mesoscale convective vortex that can also last for a couple days. But usually when we think about mesoscale, we'll think about something that's lasts for several hours. And to some extent, an exep another example of a mesoscale phenomenon just using these two values might be a supercell thunderstorm. Uh, supercell thunderstorms in the right environment can last three, four, five, sometimes even seven or eight hours in some cases. So definitely fits the criteria of a mesoscale just using the standard AMS convention. And in the case of mesoscale, sometimes a Coriolis force can be significant. And you can sort of think of this as the gray area. So sometimes if you've got something that's really large, uh, say a very large squall line, the Coriolis force can actually be significant. And uh, I believe one topic that we will talk about, I can't remember if this is actually in the schedule or not, but uh, I, you'll for sure cover this in your mesoscale meteorology class, but the Coriolis force is actually a significant factor in bow echoes, in the development, development and maturing process of bow echoes. But uh, that'll be something that you'll talk about later on. Uh, it'll either be in this class or in the mesoscale meteorology class. But for something like a supercell, that's a bit too small to be impacted by the Coriolis force in a significant way, even though it is a mesoscale phenomenon um, and it falls within the bounds of the length scale and the time scales that we defined up here. Coriolis force not as significant for a supercell. But in the mesoscale, Coriolis force can be significant. That's just, uh, it's sort of the overlap between being insignificant and being significant. And again, some examples of this squall line, derecho, uh, mesoscale convective vortex, also this thing called mesoscale convective system, something the planes has seen a lot in uh, recent days as of me recording this video. Uh, it's been a pretty unsettled pattern for uh, June standards. Been a lot of MCSs developing in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, but uh, that's always fun to, it's always uh, fun to be involved with. And the other scale that we introduced, microscale, again, typically something that's less than three kilometers in diameter. And also the uh, microscale, you're typically talking about phenomenon that lasts seconds to minutes. Uh, even if you get on, if you get to really, really small scale, sometimes that time scale can even go into fractions of a second, like milliseconds, even microseconds. Uh, if you go at a really, really fine scale turbulence, those turbulent eddies on those really small scales usually don't last longer than a few microseconds or a few milliseconds. But on the micro scale, we can safely say that Coriolis force is insignificant. And one specific phenomenon that we looked at was the tornado, and we showed just how insignificant the Coriolis force is for a tornado. But uh, other micro scale phenomenon like a microburst or a turbulent eddy, again, those turbulent motions that you get in the boundary layer or where friction is significant, those are micro scale phenomena. Those are really small. They don't last very long, typically, although a tornado technically could last for an hour. Uh, if you get a really good one, like the one that struck, I think it was, uh, what's the name of that town? Bassville, Bassport. Someone in Mississippi is going to get mad at me if they watch this video for mispronouncing that. But um, 
that city that starts with bass, that tornado that occurred uh, back in April, that one I think lasted for an over an hour. So of course they can happen, but usually not the case. Most tornadoes are down and up within a matter of minutes. So that's going to do it for this first segment on scale of motion. And in the next segments, we will start actually looking at some more mathematical definitions, sort of a way of quantifying these scales of motion in a bit more of a consistent manner. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.